Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Council Member James Tate representing District 1. Uh, and this forum today is a part of our D1 Community Accountability Network Gun Violence Prevention Initiative um, uh, series. And in the past, we've just talked about in general, how do we uh, prevent gun violence in our community? We've gotten an outpouring of support and individuals who are definitely seeking to try to curb gun violence in our community. Today, we're gonna to take a, just a slight shift, but still focus on gun violence. But this is now uh, today talking about the gun violence in accidental shootings. Uh, if you're uh, living in the city of Detroit, listening to the news, talking to folks, you've heard we've had quite a number of accidental shootings this year alone involving young people 16 and under. I'll just point uh, to put a point on it. This year, and we're just in February, just in February, there have been 16 self-inflicted and accidental shootings of minors in the city of Detroit. In 2020, there were 122 young people shot, some of which unfortunately lost their lives as a result of self-inflicted and accidental gun, uh, gun violence that took place in 2020. Now, I'm just going to throw some numbers at you. Please be patient. I promise you we're going somewhere. Uh, but listen to this. Last year, more than 23, approximately 23 million firearms were sold all of last year. That's a record. Uh, 2.1 million firearms were purchased uh, all of March. I'm sorry, in March of last year. And that's when Americans went into a frenzy and started to panic purchase food items. You remember it. Toilet tissue. Anything they can get hands on, that's what you saw hoarding. Well, not only were they hoarding toilet tissue and food items, folks are also hoarding uh, firearms. 40% of those uh, gun sales that we see now as uh, a record, uh, they were for first time buyers. We're talking about 8.4 million new gun owners in the United States in 2020. In 2021, this year, and we again, I'm talking about only. 2 million firearms have been purchased in this country. And that's an 80% increase over the same period last year. Firearm ownership has also increased uh, among African Americans. And we've seen a 56% uh, increase uh, in 2020 for African Americans purchasing uh, firearms. And last year, we saw an increase of 40% in sales regarding women. Uh, this forum is not about guns. If, are they good or bad for society? We will allow others to have that debate uh, at another day. This today, uh, this forum is to determine as a community with all these new and existing firearms that are now in households with children, how do we keep our kids safe from what we are deeming accidental shootings? Kids finding and discharging firearms and leading to multiple tragedies for far too many families. That is why we're here today. And joining us, uh, before we go any further, let me pull up a few other statistics. One we have, uh, Reggie, let's pull up that first statistic that really put a point again on uh, the information we have. When you look at the five top weeks since 2000, excuse me, since 1998 of total gun checks in this country, it shows you that March 16th through March 22nd, we had the highest in that time period, 1.1, almost 2, uh, 1.2 million individuals uh, going in and getting their firearms checked. The number two is this year, January 11th through January 17th. Going down the line, number three this year as well, 1 million individuals uh, having background checks um, following number four, June 2020 to June, uh, June 7th, 2020, a million as well. And rounding out the top five again this year, January 18th, 2021 uh, through uh, January 24th, 2021. That's a huge number. Hit that next uh, slide, Reggie, please. And this is, I think this slide really puts a point on this information has been compiled by the Washington Post. Uh, it shows that of the 10 states with the largest increase of firearm sales, we see that the state of Michigan is the highest. 
These are from uh, comparing numbers from 2020 uh, with 2021. This is just January. Joining us uh, first up is a parent who is all too familiar with the tragedy, the pain that parents have to go through following a tragedy uh, that we talked about with an accidental shooting. Uh, Ms. Cassandra Davis joins us. She's the mother of 11-year-old Jeremiah Davis, whose life was cut short when a 15-year-old friend of his got possession of his grandmother's firearm, which he held Mm -hmm. for joining us. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, I, I want to, you know, from my household to yours, uh, you know, I know it's been some years, uh, 2013 is when you lost your son, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that the pain is still there. And I just want to send our condolences uh, to you and your family. Uh, but again, thank you uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Ms. Davis, when you hear, the, thank you. When you hear these statistics, you know, 16 young people are killed accidentally this year by firearms, 122 in 2020. What, what goes through your mind as a mother who has, again, felt the pain of a parent who has lost a child as a result of this, this horrible, horrible situation? It upsets me, it disturbs me. Uh, actually, I don't look at the first 15 minutes of the news because the first 10 minutes of the news, they're speaking of tragedies. And it disturbs me to listen to it, but it comes back to me because family and friends of mine, like when the 11 year old was shot and killed by his dad somewhere in Oak Park, people think of me and they still tell me the story, even though I, I don't want to hear it because I feel every parent's pain who's going through what I've already been through. And it, it, it hurts me because as a parent, you know, just to know that others is still going through what you're going through, it's very hurtful. I just wanna hug them all, you know, and be hugged too, because it, it, it's, it's horrible. Ms. Davis, if it's not too painful, can you kind of walk us through what happened with your son because I thought just reading it, it, it just blew my mind. And I, you know, when you have people hear these stories and they hear about a, a, a young person, especially in, in an urban area, they always think the worst, right? That's always the first thing that comes to them. They must have been involved in something, they must have been doing something. Take this time, if you will, to tell us a little bit about your son and about what happened in that situation. And then what are you doing now following that? What have you done since that, that, that horrible day? Well, first of all, I could say, he was, I call him my one and only because God blessed me with this one and only for only 11 years. So it's, it's been very hard. When I say that was my world, that was my world. I grew up in Detroit, but I grew him up in the suburb. Um, it doesn't matter. I always tell people, it doesn't matter where you live. Crime is everywhere. I mean, it's on the news. People are getting shot everywhere. And um, my son, I put my all in him. I was living for him. I'm still living for him. It was, I let him spend every other weekend with his father. Of course, if I say that, that means we weren't together. Uh, he was in relationship with someone else. And every other weekend, I let my son go spend time with his father. Uh, it wasn't my son's first time over there. And when every time my son came back home and I picked him up at his grandmother's house, I grilled my son, you know, I say, what did you do? Where did you go? What did you eat? Um, those are questions as a parent, you know, when your child go away, you do ask. And I never got any type of red flag from my son. So of course I let him continue to go over there because they didn't do anything as far as I know was play video games. That's what he come home and tell me about. But this particular weekend, he went over there on a Saturday and on a Sunday, Four o'clock on a Sunday evening, I get the horrible and worst call anybody, any parent would ever want to receive is the, to rush to Children's Hospital that my son has just been shot. Um, I'm thinking that he's calling me to tell me to pick him up. Little did I know that tragedy had hit. So I didn't Zoom. I mean, when I tell you I didn't Zoom and dropped everything and hit every red light went through everything to get to my child. 
Uh, and it's by the grace of God, I didn't get hurt or no one else got hurt because when you think of tragedies like that and it's your child, your baby, you're gone. But anyway, um, on a Sunday, when, Sunday, November the 20, 24th, because I lost and he held on for me for two days. On 24th of November of 2013, uh, this boy took my son's life. Um, it's a 15 year old took my 11 year old son's life. Uh, Failey shot him in the head. He ruled him into his bedroom from the story that I heard. And Failey shot my son. Everybody, sometimes I'm suspicious because everyone is, was in a different room in the house. And my son's father tell me, well, when I left him to go to the restroom to take a shower, to bring him home to you, that things happen so quick. He was like, Jeremiah went into his bedroom with him and, you know, they didn't even know this kid had a gun. And I would never even let him go, even if I knew he had a gun over there. When I was with my ex, I took his gun out the house and gave it to um, his mother. I didn't believe in having guns. I didn't believe in guns, especially during that time when I was married. My child was my toddler then. And I... I always speak on the fact that, you know, before I even got rid of my son's, my husband, my ex-husband's um, gun was the fact that people put guns in the dumbest spots. Um, my, my ex put his gun in the dumbest spots, which was normally it's underneath your bed mattress um, or a pillow or the shelf on your closet, in your closet. Uh, if you got teenagers, those are one of the main places your teenagers would go to. Um, and if you feel like you're getting bullied, sometimes I feel like this kid maybe felt like he was getting bullied at school. I mean, I just feel that this beautiful child of mine was taken away tragically. I don't think I would feel better if it was, if he had to leave me in a different way, but it urged me every day that such an innocent choir singing kid little league baseball kid, playing the drums, karate kid. I put it all in him. Um, science and engineer at U of D, um, DAPSAP, you know. Uh, I, I put it all in him, to instill in him, to make him a good kid. And I used to always tell him, you're gonna be my little doctor when you grow up. You're gonna be Dr. Davis. And it hurts me to feel that, you know, he said, mom, I don't wanna be a doctor. I want to be an attorney for I could help put bad people in jail. So that sticks with me a lot. My attorney even cried tears with me regarding that because it's like, I never thought that I would have to ask his father, was he safe with him? You know, a lot of us do not like our kids to have sleepovers or let them go sleep over other people's house. I was one of those parents. I didn't allow my son to go to no one else's house. One particular friend he did because I knew their parents quite well and they were like me. They was on the same level that I was on. But no, I did not ask them if they had a gun in their house with two little kids in their house playing. But, you know, nowadays I feel that any parent before they even release their kid to a relative's home or even a family friend's house, it's sad to say you might need to ask those questions because um, had I known, my son would never, ever, ever, ever been over there. Sometimes I get angry. It's like, man, Jeremiah, if you would have just told me something, I didn't get no red flags, but had I known there was a gun in that house, there's no way my baby would have been over there. I didn't even allow no one to even buy my son a toy gun. He never had a little toy gun, no water guns or anything because I didn't believe in him. And everyone knew me as they gave him Christmas gifts and birthday gifts. They knew that was not the gift to get him. I didn't even allow him to have our t-shirts or any toys with the skeleton head on it. Mm -hmm. He's like, uh-uh, my mom is not gonna let me have that. I can't wear that. Because that was the way I was bringing up my child. And I was bringing him up to me the way I feel in all the right ways. And for him to be, tragically killed and this 15 year old who took my son's life, I feel that it was a slap on the face sentence because he only did three years of juvenile detention and he's out now, where at, you know, I have no idea. 
Um, and I feel that the system really failed me as a parent because I just feel that I was let go. Even when I was going through trial, it just seemed like they were more for this young defendant as in trying to rehabilitate him and get him back in order and get him more in order for society than looking at me as a parent and as a victim. Their thing is trying to straighten out th these troubled youth. But I always feel since this has happened that when you do wrong, just like Beretta back in the day, there's a price that everyone should pay. You know, everyone know guns is wrong. Go guns kill people, they hurt people, you know, and when it does that, they hurt people physically and mentally. I'm mentally gone. My son is physically gone and due to the effects of a gun. Yeah, Miss. So, so what I want to ask you, and, and I know that after um, the incident happened with, happened with your son, you started a, uh, a petition and you got it going. And you, I know you were looking for stronger uh, laws that would address this type of situation. Before we bring up our next panel uh, to talk a little bit about that, uh, tell us a little bit about, about what you were seeking to do with this uh, petition and where is it at right now? Where do you wanna see it? Is there any type of legislation that's out there that you're seeking uh, to address to um, curb incidents like this in the future? Well, since I lost my son, um, I have seen on the news where a lot of juvenile defenders um, have gotten off you know, uh, manslaughter, or they gotten off, juvenile service, but uh, no one that I have seen, well, maybe one or two have actually got char charged as an adult, with the exception, you know, Abraham, he he was a 12 year old, but I just still, I, it, it just stuck in my spirit that anyone who does wrong when it comes to a um, guns, that there's a price to pay. That way you have time to think about it. Um, I can't say whether this kid who took my son's life was remorseful or not, you know, um, but he was in the system for, th for three years, but I'm not sure if that's a little kitty jail. You, he wasn't in there with everyone else. And that's the part that gets me the most is the fact that it gives people things to think, the kids something to think about. You know, because guns is out here so rapidly, they could easily get it. Um, I'm not too far from the Livonia area. I don't live in Livonia, but they had a big sign when I was going down a certain street that says gun show. And there's a lot of people going in and out of this place to uh, show off their guns or buy guns. So that just means more in the streets, you know, because, you know, people react more before you know, than they think. And I just really just, I just wish my petition were really to give people to think about when they have youth or anyone who was reading that. My, the person who murdered my son was 15 years old. Those who are like 14 to 17 years old, they know better. Even 12 year olds, guns are wrong. You know, parents sometimes will need to be accountable for it the their acts and where they're putting their guns in their house um because that's the first thing they do they react so my petition was mainly to um to give the uh, lansing area uh legislature uh, individuals in the capital something to think about because we as citizens in the city we see it every day and it needs to be put out there for these kids to be example and be like, oh, you know, someone needs to even go to the schools. Like, hey, if you shoot someone, you get your mom or your dad, your granddad's guns, you can go to jail. Do not react and think because someone is bullying you um, that you want to go and get your parents' gun and bring it back to school or lure them someplace to shoot them because you feel hurt. Uh, there's still a price to pay. Absolutely. So I I want to make sure that we have time to bring up our next guest, and I want to do that because I want to talk about uh, kind of where we segued into laws and, and also the grief that parents and uh, have to uh, go through, both the parent of the victim and as well as the, the parent of the, the perpetrator. Uh, joining us next, I want to bring up our next two guests, uh, Mr. Chad King. He is the president of the Black Bottom Gun Club. 
I'll just give you a little information about the Black Bottom Gun Club. It's the first chapter, a member of the National African American Gun Association of Michigan. It's based out of and it serves uh, Detroit and the surrounding cities. The Black Bottom Gun Club is named after, as many of us know, a very historic area in the city of Detroit uh, called Black Bottom uh, that endured a lot of challenges during the Great Depression uh, during World War II. So thank you, Ms. Chad King, for Mr. Chad King for joining us. Uh, also joining us today is Dr. Chandra Carr. She's not a stranger to us at all. Uh, we thank you for being here. Uh, she is the uh, CEO and founder of Miller Carr Human Services. And we brought her here, uh, invited her to just help us unpack all of this. And uh, Dr. Carr also works with uh, victims of gun violence as well. So very familiar with this issue. Again, thank both of you for joining us. Um, Chad, I want to start with you. Um, I'm sure you heard Ms. Davis' story and, and how tragic it is. And when we look at the numbers of African Americans, and we know it's no secret that the city of Detroit has a, a predominantly African American population, um, when we look at all of the, the guns that we have now recently seen uh, being acquired around this country in the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan, that doesn't always mean that folks are uh, prepared. And, uh, and, and know how to secure those firearms. So what do you, what do you, what do you say to a, a new gun owner? And I know that you actually have training. What do you say to a new gun owner who uh, is not familiar with the laws, not familiar with the firearm, but want to protect their family? What do you tell them about keeping that firearm safe? Sure, th so first, uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me. Um, uh, before I proceed with that answer, I do want to uh, speak to Ms. Sandra Davis. Uh, first, I want to say I'm terribly sorry for your loss. There is no pain uh, that I can fathom that equates to a parent losing their child or a mother losing their child. So uh, I want you to know that this is something, uh, even though I do own firearms and even though, that, even though I am uh, a firearms advocate in terms of education and training, um, please understand that there are many of us who believe that the loss of your child and many other children in those similar situations is absolutely needless and is absolutely unnecessary. Um, so you absolutely have my deepest sympathies and condolences. Um, and from the position that I have as a uh, member of the Second Amendment community to a degree, and as the chapter president of the Black Bottom Gun Club and the Midwestern Regional Director of the National African American Gun Association, I do wanna let you know that we work very, very hard to make sure that people are educated on firearm safety. Um, I'm not going to say that um, or, or, or try to make any excuses because there is no excuse, um, but I did wanna get that out there. Uh, Councilman Tate, to answer your question relative to safe storage and what do I tell people, First of all, I'll let everyone know that I encounter that firearm safety is everyone's responsibility, meaning it is the individual's responsibility, it is the family's responsibility, and it's the community's responsibility. Um, often we talk about firearm safety as this um, thing that is quote unquote common sense, but gun safety is not common sense, unfortunately, because if it was common sense, there would be a lot of things that go wrong that we would all think is okay. Uh, but we realize that the things that go wrong are not okay. And so one of the things I tell people all the time is that you're responsible for every firearm uh, that you encounter, and you're responsible for every round cartridge or bullet that leaves that firearm, 100%. Uh, you're absolutely 100% responsible for it. And so I take that, or excuse me, I also let people know that firearm storage, making sure that the firearms are secure from unauthorized persons so that they cannot have access to those firearms is of the utmost importance to prevent tragedies like we've seen this year already, so many times already. Um, it, it, it's one of those things that I really do lose sleep in and I really do get angry about it. Um, I have a passion for, so I, I do like shooting. I like the sport of it. Uh, I do competitive shooting. I like teaching people how to use a firearm in self-defense to defend their families, right? But I'm also very, very, very passionate about making sure that people are doing things in the right way and that people are doing things in the safe way. And not only that, and people are educated, not only as an individual, but they're educating their family on the right things to do. Uh, so there is, a federal, there is a federal statute that states that children, minors under the age of 18 are, it, it's illegal for them to possess a firearm, right? 
And so that's a federal statute. And so if you are a person who is not locking up your firearm and not securing your firearm to prevent access to a child, then you are um, being negligent in a sense. Well, not in a sense, you're literally being negligent because you're being derelict of the law at that point. Um, in the state of Michigan, there are no statutes that specify that you have to lock your firearm up. Um, and, and I suspect that's for a variety of reasons, only because not everyone lives with children, right? Um, not, only, not everyone has younger children around the house. Um, I have several firearms and I keep my firearms locked up, uh, not only in the safe, but also with a lock on the gun as well to ensure that my children don't have access to the firearms, whether it's my, not just my children, um, but also my cousins or my nieces or nephews as well, because it's not just my children that I have to be concerned with, it's everyone's uh, child who come, every other, you know, parent's child that comes to my house, I'm responsible for them as well while they're in my home, right? And because I'm responsible for them in my home, I have to make sure that my items are locked up and inaccessible to not only the children, but also irresponsible adults also, right? Um, I have to make sure that I am doing things in the right way to set the example for those around me so that they can do those things in the right way. I have to walk it like I talk it. I have to teach it and I have to preach it the same way. Um, so it, it's really, really important to me that, you know, as a gun club, one of the things that we that we often do is we hold free safety and legal seminars so that, you know, people in the community know what gun safety actually is, how you can actually be safe with firearms. We also often contract with an attorney who talks about various laws in the state of Michigan relative to owning and possessing firearms. We do that as a free of charge to educate people on what to do and what not to do with the firearm. Um, Oftentimes, well, pre-COVID, right, because we haven't been able to get out much, but we're actually going to uh, kick that off very soon. Uh, we will be out in the community passing out gun locks because we're a partner with the National Shooting Sports Foundation Project Child Safe, and we will pass out gun locks for free of charge and provide them with the informational brochure on firearm safety. Uh, we're big on education, so much so that one of the things that we're going to begin doing, we're rolling out our youth uh, firearm safety initiative so that children as young as 10 years old and up know what to do around firearms to be safe. We want to demystify firearms so that we don't have a 15 year old who's never held a firearm or dealt with a firearm in a controlled and in a respectful manner doesn't do anything as egregious as harm another child or themselves, right? We educate parents on that as well. Chad, I want to uh, bring Dr. Carr in here real quick. Uh, Dr. Carr, you know, when we have a situation where there's an accidental shooting, there's emotions that are out there within the community, within the families, again, with the perpetrator's family, as well as the victim's family. How do we as a community, how do we reconcile our feelings for a parent who, you know, again, they lost a child, but their child was also, they were also neglectful in their firearm being uh, left unsecure. How do we as a community, you know, how do we treat how do we how do we treat those type of people? You know what that that type of situation. How do we reconcile our feelings? Well, I, I do want to say um, first to Miss Davis, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, I know that um, the loss that you have is very great, and I appreciate you sharing that with us um, because that right there is education in itself being able to tell our stories helps us to know what to do and not to do the next time. It also makes us aware of what is really going on in our community, in our homes, for us to think twice about who we let in our homes and why we're letting them in there. It's a lot of grief that we deal with. Um, it's a lot of sorrow and there's a lot of feelings of uh, what could I have done on both sides of the spectrum because I'm sure that the parent of the child that killed someone else is feeling the same way, you know, but their grief is a little bit different, but the grief is still there. The sorrow is still there. And I agree that we definitely have to educate. We definitely have to put these programs out in the community that they are seen so that people can participate. And I'm so glad that Mr. King and his team and his program is available for as young as 10, which is awesome because as young as seven, you can definitely understand what guns are, what they're about. But if no one teaches you, if no one shows you or explain it to you, then you have no thought and idea of what that is. So if we're going to have guns in the 
the home, then it's best that we explain to our children what they are and what they are used for or not supposed to be used for because they need to have an understanding of both sides of the coin. And so as a community, we need to love on the, um, the mothers and the families who have uh, endured that loss. Um, a lot of times what I do is try to use like a trauma focused approach with anyone who has dealt with any type of violence such as this or um, any hurt or pain or grief in a violent way. And it just allows you to look at them mentally, behaviorally, emotionally, and physically, all of them surrounded. And it's not just the child who may have inflicted the pain is the parents too. They get that same type of help and support as well. So I think that if we just continue to support, if we continue to um, make aware and then we continue to be open to learn and to trust uh, each other with the information that is going on, I think that's helpful as well. Yeah, so, and, and I just wanna bounce right back to you, Chad, really quickly before we bring in our next guest. You know, many times when there are tragedies and we have a, a, a scourge of tragedies that take place, there is a call for laws to be changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Change this law, change that law. And sometimes there are well-intentioned, sometimes there are political decisions that are made. Um, what's the, what, what, what is the challenge, or I don't wanna call it a danger necessarily, but what's the challenge in uh, immediately going to changing laws without doing the proper analysis of the actual situation? Well, I think you, you, you just said it really is failing to look at root, call, root causes. We fail to, we're, we really, we're really, really bad at root cause analysis and thus root cause mitigation of trauma and tragedy, right? We go straight to um, not so much a triage, but almost like an ER type of a uh, uh, solution where we'll look at a problem, we'll say, okay, how can we get this serviceable? And we'll put a Band-Aid over a puncture wound, which is in effect what a gun control law would do, right? Or a gun law would do is to put a Band-Aid over a puncture wound in many cases, right? It doesn't necessarily deal with the root causes such as um, being economically destitute or being uh, the lack of the education or lack of opportunity that a lot of times precedes violence or is an indicator of violence. We don't deal with the things that are the indicators of violence or the causes of violence. We look at violence as a cause in and of itself. And that's not always the case. The other piece of it that a lot of times uh, can be harmful is when we look at firearms laws. Um, when we have to, and it's, I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but when you look at the history of firearms laws and the intersection of Black life in America, there's always been this opposing force in that African Americans were traditionally prohibited from owning and obtaining firearms to defend themselves and their families, right? And so when you look at uh, even modern gun control, gun, excuse me, gun control policies or prescriptions today, there's oftentimes the issue that we will be uh, more negatively impacted by those laws simply because it increases the likelihood of interaction with law enforcement. And this isn't to say that all law enforcement is bad, but what it does say is that uh, typically we see the encounters with law enforcement as more violent than with us than with any other demographic. And so when you increase the likelihood of an interface with law enforcement, there's the propensity or the chance that that will happen as well. All right, Ms. Ms. Davis, uh, Ms. King and Dr. Carr, please don't go anywhere. We're gonna bring you back for our uh, next our segment after this. But I wanna bring in uh, Commander Kyra jo Joy Hope, as well as uh, Mr. William McMurray, along with MPO Eric Hill uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, we've been talking about gun safety and making sure that the firearms are secure. And so we wanna see what is the city of Detroit doing? What, what's being done out here, even by private citizens to try to curta curtail this particular issue? Uh, Commander Hope, again, thank you for joining us. And we heard about, it was a press conference about the gun locks that the city of Detroit, the police department has initiated, uh, has gone out and really making a huge push to change this situation in the city of Detroit. Can you talk to us a little bit about how this program came about, uh, what is in the future for it, and how can citizens in the city of Detroit, especially gun owners, take part 
in this particular program. Well, thank you, um, Councilman Tate. Um, yes, and thank you, uh, D. Rob and Hill with me today. And yes, we did have the press conference. And I just want to say this, um, my condolences as well. And I was one of those teenagers uh, for gun violence before I even joined the police department. And that was one of the reasons why I joined. And I've, I'm here 35 years later uh, after I was struck by a bullet um, mm -hmm. through gang violence. Uh, so my heart goes out uh, to Mrs. Davis. But what I want to say is like far too, far too, too often have our front page headlines included our investigations of accidental shootings. And they were involving children who found unsecure weapons in their home and accidentally harmed themselves or someone else. And what we've experienced in the city of Detroit are that those accidents in the homes could have been prevented. And it, it was caused by just unauthorized individuals, often a child, finding a loaded and an unsecured firearm. And I, wanted, I would like to share three little stories with you um, of stats. And on Monday, January 24th of 2021, and I was at approximately 11.22 p.m. in the 14,000 block of Hubble, a four-year-old male victim accidentally shot himself after a firearm was left unsecured on a table. And then again on Wednesday, January the 20th, 21, at approximately 9.30 a.m. in the 24,000 block of Sturdivant, a five-year-old child sustained a fatal injury after an 18-month-old child located an unsecured handgun. And then again on Friday, October the 30th, 2020, at approximately 11 p.m. in the 15,000 block of Kentucky, an eight-year-old female was fatally shot by an 11-year-old child located who located an unsecured weapon again in the residence and accidentally shot an eight-year-old. You know, and we believe that, you know, this risk of firearms-related uh, incidents and deaths can be re reduced simply by securing the weapon. And with our Child uh, Protective Child Safety Pledge will help us with that. And MPO uh, Hill and MPO Robinson, uh, they have been instrumental in achieving uh, the goal of getting 1,000 gun locks to be delivered to every single precinct. And we started this initiative last week where the residents started to pick up the, the gun locks with no questions asked whatsoever. You know, and we just ask that when you pick up the free gun lock from the precinct, that you also pay attention because there's a brochure in there. And we want you to pick up the information in the brochure and really really pledge against leaving that weapon unsecured. And if I could share one other thing with you, Councilman, just a couple of stats here. For 2021, the Detroit Police Department reported 16 self-inflicted accidental shootings. And then again, in 2020, we had a record of 84 non-fatal shootings. Wow. That's incidents involving children under the age of 17 compared to 37 reported in 2019. And then again in 2020, we reported 122 self-inflicted accidental shootings. And again in 2020, it was a, record, a record of nine fatal shootings involving children under the age of 17, compared to five reported from 2019. So with that, we encourage everyone who owns a firearm to store it, when it's not in use and that is not accessible to these children and that the ammunition also should be stored separately. And Councilman, if I could ask uh, Tate and Hill, if they can chime in with some safety tips for us. Please do. And, and after you guys speak, we're gonna go into the video to actually show folks how to use these uh, the gun locks that you all are offering. Officer Hill, good to see you as always. MPO mm -hmm. Hill. Officer uh, Robinson, good to see you as well. Thank you. You know, Councilman. So um, I do as well send my condolences um, for any loss of life, especially uh, tragically, like we've heard, definitely do. And it's some things that you will hear from us that's repetitive, and it needs to be repetitive so that we could have this kind of stuff instilled in our brain as firearms uh, owners. And, you know, one of the things, as you already heard, and you'll hear it several times as a firearm um, owner, is your responsibility to safely uh, handle, secure, store your firearm. You need to know what you're doing when you own a firearm. 
you need to know how to how to load it, how to unload it safely, you know, how to clean it. We have people trying to clean their their guns, shooting themselves. I think we just recently had one, um, not not long ago. Um, but you should always keep that or treat that firearm as if it's loaded, point it in a safe direction. Make sure that when you store this firearm in your house, you store it. Um, there's several options. So you use a gun lock that come with it. When you buy a firearm, it's uh, mandated by the federal government that every newly purchased firearm has a has a gun a gun lock with it. Or if that's not good enough for you, there's several options that's available for you to go out and purchase, see what's right for you, see uh, what you need for your uh, self-defense. I hear a lot of people saying, hey, well, what if I need to get to my, my firearm uh, right away um, because of home defense? Well, there's several options out there. Or if you are leaving your firearm inside of your vehicles, several options. Do the research, invest in yourself and your family's safety because that little uh, moment of investment and, and the time, it will save lives. MPO Hill. Officer Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that pledge that Commander was speaking on is right here. And when we give that the lockout to our citizens, a pledge is going to go with it also and the responsibilities and safe tips for the, the parents as well. And uh, I know you're going to show a video in a second. I just want to sidebar on something too. Now, those who have individuals at home that may be a high risk, that may be someone with mental illness, that may be someone who's going through a lot of stress because of the pandemic, uh, as well as the children in the household, uh, you need to secure those weapons. Uh, stress is happening very much so, and with suicides occurring. So again, with our babies and with this pandemic also, you may have some high risks in the home uh, that you need to really be safe and, and secure about that weapon that you have a constitutional right to have. Uh, so with that note, I know it's a video that's gonna be showed to demonstrate the cable lock that we are presenting and giving to all the citizens in the city of Detroit, uh, how to properly just put it on your firearm as well as your long guns. Um, but be safe out there and situational awareness. Be aware of your environment and who you have in your home also. You know, I, I heard the young lady speak about having her, having her son to visit people houses and sleepovers. You know, we gotta be aware of the environments in the company that we have our children placed in front of. Absolutely. And so, so last, last thing before we go to the video, uh, what does the pledge say? Uh, I know you have it in front of you. What, what, what are we, okay. those of us who are walking, get, come in and pick up the gun lock, what are we gonna be signing and pledging? Okay, the, the pledge you wanna have is for your child. It's uh, from Project Safe Child, uh, and it says, I hereby promise I will not handle a gun uh, without the permission of a grown up that I know. Same as we did with Eddie Eagle, that's from any age. Stop, don't touch, lead the area, tell an adult. I always go into the schools and we say that. Secondly, it says, I will never play with the gun. As you know, we're supposed to know that treat guns as if they're always loaded, toy or not. Uh, sec uh, thirdly, I would not go snooping around or allow my friends to go snooping around for guns in my house. And that's keeping it safe and secure so the child can tell their friends who come over the house, hey, we're not snooping around. But that's, a, that's the job of the parents to I identify where the firearms, keep them safe and locked up as our other panel has spoke on. Uh, fourth, if I find a gun, even if it looks like a toy, I will not touch it. Again, stop, don't touch, lead the area, tell an adult. I will tell a grown up right away. I will obey the rules and safe and uh, safe regulations of handling the gun. That means stop, don't touch, lead the area, tell an adult. The parent is signing it, the student will sign it, the child in the house will sign it, rather. And then, uh, and take that oath, but to the parents. If you are a CPL holder, you, you, are, you should know Never, never handle that firearm. Treat like it's always loaded. Uh, again, uh, take that oath, but as a parent, you know, life is important. And we just have to be responsible as a legal firearm uh, owner. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And 
Reggie, if we can Thank keep you. up the, uh, the video so we can uh, show the audience uh, what DPD has prepared for us. Hello, my name is MPO Eric, the Detroit Police Department. Today I want to demonstrate how you properly place a gun cable lock on your firearm. All firearms that you see on this display has been made safe and they are not loaded at all. They have been made safe. <coughs> all right, as you can see, each type of weapon from a revolver to a long gun, a rifle, semi-automatic, have that cable lock. With this cable lock, what you simply do, again, the gun has been made safe. Through your ejection port, you're gonna place the cable through the magazine feed. Into the lock here, you have another entry where you place the cable. So lay it down, firmly place it in there, simply take the key out, check again, it is locked and secure. A firearm is secure at this point. Again, this is the cable lock for your firearm. Be safe. This is a blue gun plastic. It's here, you just put your finger there, turn green, it drops off, it's secure. You have a gun lock here, it has an alarm system on it. Somebody touch it, it goes off. You already know somebody touched your firearm and they picked it up. And over here, you rather than mention ammunition, you can put it up to keep the lock safe. Also, you have a gun safe zones, hospital, schools, you can't have to bring it on your person. These are lots of things you can cable to your vehicle. Last resort, and just have it uh, right there you can secure in your vehicle. All right, that was the DPD providing us a, a in, informational instruction on how to apply these gun locks to your firearm. And you know, this is a the person I'm about to introduce now is a gentleman who I've known for a number of years, and he has. Uh, he started a, a gun lock uh, company uh, quite a number of years ago, and he's kept up with it. Um, we're talking well over 15, 20 years. Uh, and that individual is uh, Mr. William McMurray. Uh, Mr. McMurray, thank you for joining us. You are the inventor and founder of The Rack, American Rack, R-A-C. Uh, briefly, before we go into Q&A with the rest of the panel, talk to us just briefly about what is The Rack? Why did you decide to create it? And again, what should the community do to be able to purchase and participate in uh, gun safety using your particular product? Thank you so much, Councilman Tate. I'm honored to be part of the panel. Uh, as you know, when you were still a police officer, we became friends and you've always supported me. And I thank you for that. I also like to acknowledge my other panelists, uh, Mrs. Davis, God bless Jeremiah, your angel, uh, it just didn't have to happen like that. Uh, I invented the rack in 1999. I got my first provisional patent. And then in 2003, I got my first patents. And I've had giveaways in the city of Detroit and Chicago and Las Vegas and Washington, D.C. and Birmingham, Alabama, because corporate sponsors felt it was important to give something a little bit more than the cable lock. I don't knock anybody's method for doing anything if that's what we have that's what we have but we needed something a little bit more stronger so that's why we came up with the rack i am a member of national shooting sports foundation i am very familiar with the home safe project uh i know everybody on that team I'm, i go to shot show every year uh the rack is a product that i we, we stand behind uh because it's, it's it's just durable i have one here the rack is made out of high carbon steel one uh, configuration will fit any handgun. This is a 40 caliber. It goes behind the trigger house in the front. And that's as simple as it is. It's rubber coated, never scratch items. It could be mounted in your vehicle or in your home. So that's the rack. But, but like the forum says today, you know, we need to educate. This is about education, uh, having a different system. When you have a deadly firearm, now you have new responsibilities. I really admire Canada, our neighbor to the south of us, but north, to the point that they have a 25-year penalty for doing a crime with a handgun. 
it's hard for my National Shooting Sports Foundation legislative arm to even ever advocate for something like that. So I understand the politics of it, but it needs to be more detention and, and de deterrence from, from using firearms, period. But what I will say is when my children go to visit, that is a question we ask. Are there firearms in the home? Are they secure? And if the answers aren't right, my kids don't get to stay there. In retrospect, it's so much we try to do. The, the reason why it's racked is restoring American confidence in having firearm, proper firearm ownership, proper firearm usage. And, 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 and see, my kids were taught at a young age, this is a firearm, don't touch it, it'll kill you. When you get of age, I will show you how to use it. So there's, that's the talk for firearm people. Police officers know that. You have a conversation with your, your children, with your cousins, your niece, nieces and nephews. When they come to your house, this gun is a deadly uh, item. It will kill you. And I need you not to touch it. Like the, the commander said earlier, you find a gun in the house, you stop. You don't touch it. You find an adult and then we, we deal with it and render it harmless. So I did this for a motion for the last 20 years. I've been, I've been with this movement. I know the statistics every year, how many kids get a hold of guns and how many die. CDC has, has always helped me know the facts. So all I can tell you is we will be working with some downtown casinos and big businesses, and we will provide the rack as a giveaway. We've done it before. When Mr. Illich was alive, he was always there. He would always give me 50000 hundred thousand dollars to give away free racks. We will be doing that again soon. So just be looking out for that. Uh, we want to make sure that when you have a firearm in the house, that you have something that's solid that will work. And so that's why we created the rack. I'm very uh, grateful to have the opportunity to show it to you. And I would love to collaborate with any groups that would like to have some prevention and education dialogue that we could do on a mass basis to our community. So thank you, Councilman Tate. You're doing a great job. Thank you. I, I appreciate you being here, Mr. McMurray. Uh, and the reason why we wanted to make sure you were here uh, is because you are a Detroiter. You live in the city of Detroit. You thankfully have not had a tragedy take place in your life regarding uh, accidental shooting, but it was just on your heart to do something. You've continued to do it over the years. And I just want to, again, thank you for, for that. Uh, we're going to go to you, uh, NPO Hill, uh, and then we, uh, did you raise your hand? Okay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to know the cost, Mr. McMurray. The rack for my police officers is always $50, but for citizens, it's usually $60. So it's $10 more for citizens. Right now, they are at Action Impact on 8 Mile and Beach Daily, and they're at Cloverleaf Market at, eight, at 12 Mile and Telegraph. And so you can just go up there and say you've seen it, and law enforcement, like I say, $50 for law enforcement, $60 for for the general public. Awesome, and, and, and again, part of the reason why we wanted to make sure that uh, Mr. McMurray was here, of course DPD is here, to again, give you just an understanding of the audience. It's not just one type of gun lock that you can get. There's several that are out there. Some people don't want the, the one with the, 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 the string or the, the cable. They want something a little bit more durable, but the reality is do something. You do something. something, that's something right, Councilman Let me children. just say one last thing. Hold on, before, hold on, Ms. Nord, hold on, hold on a second. Uh, we're going to go to the public. They're going to have an opportunity to ask questions after you speak. Uh, those who are calling by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Those of you who want to ask the question, you're on the web. If you have a Windows computer, it's Alt plus Y. And if you're on an Apple's computer, it is Option plus Y. Again, if you're on the telephone, it's star nine if you want to raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, if you're on an Apple computer, it's option Y. If you're on a Windows computer, it's alt plus Y. And we also have the ability to ask the questions on Facebook as well. Uh, Mr. McMurray, we're going to give you the last uh, uh, last uh, response before we go to the full panel and open up for questions. Mr. McMurray. Yeah, Councilman Tate, let me just say this. You know, I'm a 58-year-old full-time Detroiter, grew up on 14th and Puritan. One of my dear friends, Adonis Tillman, right in high school, he found the shotgun and blew his head off. And I, I've never been the same since then. And this is one of the things that inspired me to, to, to do the rack. And, and I've just, it's just countless lives. And, and as uh, Brother King said, you know, every time that I hear about a kid accessing a gun, I feel that I fail 
and get my message across that there are solutions out here. And, and so I just, I just want it to be a zero. I remember last thing, I remember when Mr. Illich did it the first time, we gave away 1,500 racks, DTE, <clears throat> Motor City Casino, and, and um, Omega Sci-Fi. And that next year, I'm telling you, it was so weird. It was zero. Zero firearm deaths in, you look it up, in 2011. So we're just grateful for that little peak, that little pause in the, in the tragedy for that little period of time. Thank you, Councilman Thank Taylor. You. And we're hopeful that with the actions of DPD, you and others, everybody on this panel, quite honestly, that we'll see that uh, reduction yet again, and not just short term, but long term. Amen. All right, so now we're going to bring the entire panel. Thank you all for coming back. Uh, we're not going to open up for Q&A. You know, we've, we've, we've talked about it. Now we want to make sure that we have an opportunity for those who are watching today to ask questions and engage. Uh, so we're going to first go to, uh, let's go to Zoom. Yelena, do we have any questions on Zoom? Yes, Councilman. We actually have a few in the chat. And okay. one of the questions that was asked was by Representative Kavanaugh's office. I'm not sure if it's the rep or not. She asked, what can Michigan legislators do to help with gun issue sales such as these? So you said gun, gun sales? Yeah, with the gun issues that we're discussing slash sales, what can legislators do to assist? Okay, so the, the question is what, what can legislators do to address, I would say, you know, illegal firearms, um, firearms that are changing hands illegally, whether it's for, with kids or if we're talking about firearms that have been stolen from, from homes. Uh, any suggestions at all? This is, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Mary Cavanaugh is a brand new state rep. And so she's looking for uh, input and insight from the community. You have an opportunity to provide that to her. So what should she be working on? Uh, I can go to you first, Ms. Davis. Uh, Mary Cavanaugh, representative, she wants to know, what, what, what can legislators do to address this issue of uh, gun violence and accidental shootings with children? If I think we have you on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's part of the reason why I um, started up a, a change.org. And that was regarding the, the juvenile being sentenced as an adult. Everything to me will have to go to the state capitol. You have to get to those individuals there. I only got 206 people to sign my petition, but I made the quota with 206 people. But the thing is too, is the more the awareness you put out there to get people to sign petitions to get it to the state. And everything has to go to Lansing. We all will have to petition. I know there's individuals from other organizations that gather together as a group and they make their calls and reasoning by going to the Capitol to, to talk to the senators and stuff there. So that's a start. Okay. Yelena, do we have another question or anybody else from the panel want to uh, chime in on that? Yes. Um, I, oh, uh, uh, Ms. King. Yes, yeah, so I think from a legislative perspective, what can be done is putting some of the funding into looking at root cause issue, right? Um, because like I said before, we really don't do enough of that. I understand the immediacy of the issue. I'm not going to take away from the immediacy of the problem. Um, I kind of like to work backwards, meaning I look at the outcome that I want to have and kind of pair back to see what things will work, what things may not work if the outcome would be different if things have been had changed, right? What we do know from data is that the majority of uh, violence that's committed by firearm in the country, and particularly when you look at you know, mass shootings or person personal violence uh, or interpersonal violence, excuse me, a lot of that's not from stolen firearms, they're from legally acquired firearms. Uh, initially, uh, secondary to that, they're from straw purchases, right? Which are illegal transactions of firearms. So meaning a person acquires a, a firearm legally. And then what happens is, the they will sell that firearm to a person who is not allowed to have one legally, right? So there's a straw purchase issue uh, that occurs or a straw purchase problem that we have as well. We can step in the penalties for straw purchases, right? 
which is one way to go about it. Uh, make 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 that uh, a more exacting punishment for the person who sells the firearm uh, illegally also. But a lot of times what we see is um, in 2020, we saw ma a massive influx, like you showed at the very beginning, a massive in influx of brand new gun owners, a lot of background checks. So clearly we have a lot of background checks that are being taken place. A lot of people are being approved for those uh, for those firearm purchases in a legal way. Uh, it's a smaller percentage of those who are doing things illegally with those purchases. And I think that that's, if we're going to do any legal changes, then we need to make sure that we are um, heavily doling out the punishment at, at, that fits the, that uh, exceeds the crime in that instance because of the stakes are so high. Elena, do we have a, another question? Yes, we have uh, Ms. Cheryl Webb. I'm gonna allow her to speak. Um, she had a question, she had her hand raised. Cheryl, Hello. thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. Hi everyone on, on the panel. Uh, I just had a brief comment. First of all, uh, Sandra, my heart goes out to you and uh, Commander Joy um, being a, a victim of, of um, gun violence. Our family was also a victim of gun violence. Um, in 2014, my cousin was uh, murdered right in front of my grandmother. Um, it was interesting to hear because when we, when you think about gun violence, you just think about uh, tragedies and uh, people just riding up on each other. That's why I was uh, so um, proud of everyone on the panel because you don't know about um you are not aware about children and gun locks and gun control i even took the time out to call my daughter she's 24 to say hey uh to uh you know chime in uh one of uh one of the things i just wanted to comment and i'll, and I'll just hurry up is i think that it has a lot to do with the mental health and the mental state of individuals, kind of like how uh, Mr. King was uh, saying, in situations when a, a child picking up a firearm, an adult picking up a firearm, even if it's not yours, you are in a mental state. We, I think the legislation, legislators should look into more, not just in Detroit, more mental health uh, facilities. It's time for us to heal. Even during COVID, a lot of us are feeling just stuck in the house or, you know, not able to go out and things and things like that that's one of the things that we could do uh to improve and just forums like this um just letting people know to be aware of gun violence but a child to me could be 23 or 24 years old when my child came home with a legal firearm i went out to uh what where was it Livon not La past lavonia and asked them um what kind of background ch check did you do just to give my daughter a firearm? And uh, the man at the desk was like, better she have it on her than without her. And I just said, did we come to this, Kate, uh, did we come to this in this world where people are saying, um, Cheryl, you need to get you a gun. I don't know why you're tripping. This is just insane. We need to all uh, get a grip and get, we all need to see what is the mental things that's going on because we can't control every single person. People that need to hear this are probably not even watching. We hope that we could bring more awareness. That's right. Wow. Do you have, you have a question for the panel at all? Um, my, my, my question is, what do you guys think that we could do um, I know it's COVID and things like that, but but besides our Zoom, to bring more awareness to, I, when I went out to the gun shop, I had to stand in line because it was about 15 children. I called them children. They were under the age of 30. They were of age and legally able. They were getting assault rifles, not just firearms. They were getting guns that required big cases that I didn't even know that with beans and you know, like so what, what's, what's your question? Are we want to we want to get him a chance to answer? My question: What can we do to bring more awareness to the uh, youth that that's running around with these firearms that need to see these panels more? How can we um, 
reach? What can we do? Community policing, what can we do to reach, reach out more for the people who need to hear this and see this, be aware? Anyone well, from just, the panel? Mm -hmm. Commander, whoever wants to Yes, stand. Councilman Tate. So just to address, um, thank you, Cheryl, so much. Um, but we run a, a gamut of uh, youth programs here uh, up under the Chiefs Neighborhood Liaison. And I'd be more than happy um, to discuss some of these with you, uh, sidebar. We, we have things set up where we talk about quality of life issues and things in the community that affect our, our children and affect decisions. and and how do we make the best decisions, you know, within our, our team. So we do have that format, our MPOs as well. We, we're also uh, partnered with the Pistons, uh, Ford Conversations. We have a lot of dialogue with a lot of support. So if you're really interested in that, I would love to talk to you about some of those things. All right, uh, I, I, I wanted to chime in, Councilman, real quick. Sure. What we're dealing with now, though, is we have a, a pandemic of mental illness, civil war, race war, and the COVID virus. So as a result of that, that's where all those people made a run on the gun stores in March. Your statistics at the beginning were, were so shocking and revealing, but you know, us in the industry, we know that. What we have to do is play the tape all the way through. We have the right to bear arms. That's our second amendment right. The only thing that I advocate and a lot of us on the panel is you have the right to bear arms responsibly. Mm -hmm. You don't jump for the gun mm -hmm. as soon as you have a conflict with your neighbor or your son or your or your mm -hmm. friend or coworker. You got to mm -hmm. go through the, the conflict resolution. The firearm, as we learn in training, Absolutely. when you get ready to pull out the firearm, this is a fatal decision. This is not I'm mad at you. You disrespected me. See, and what we have is this younger generation is quick to quick to anger, quick to move. That's so right. We got to play the tape all the way through, y'all. And we got to get back to them common sense values that I learned in the 60s and 70s that, you know, we could leave the doors open. We knew who the one crazy person was. We just had to watch out for them. See, the problem is now it's totally inverse. It's probably on your block. You got more crazy people. So it's just a different time. And it's just horrible to have to say that. But at the end of the day, uh, the law needs to change, to, in my opinion, from being in the National Shooting Sports Foundation, being around them guys, the people who went to the Capitol, hey, that's my base. I see them every year at SHOT Show. They buy gun locks from me because they don't want their gun stolen. When I deal on the other side with my, my, my liberal side, we care about kids and gun safety. See, so you got different mindsets. Some people had a right to bear arms and some people had a right to, to keep kids safe. So it's political, it's mental, it's everything. But the bottom line is responsible firearm ownership is the root cause to keep these guns from getting in the wrong hands. A yes, child sir. can't resolve conflict with a gun. We used to fight. I might be friends with you in a couple of months because we ain't doing no gunfight. We just fighting. Mm -hmm. they, just, they gotta change the mindset, Councilman. I, I want to make sure I, I have every, an opportunity for everyone to get a chance to chime in on this. When you said you have the right to uh, bear arms responsibly, I saw uh, Mr. King's head bob up and down. And I see your hand up, uh, Brother King. What, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, I, I want to echo that sentiment because rights do carry responsibilities, right? They're not uh, infinite things. They're, they, they, they come with things that you can and cannot do, or they come with things that you should and should not do, right? So being a responsible firearm is absolutely the thing that you should do. Uh, to the answer to the question from uh, Cheryl Webb about what can we do to bring awareness to people, um, I can say that as a gun club, one of the things that we've been able to do uh, is host, like I said earlier, we host webin webinars and in-person gatherings where we talk about firearm safety from the individual the familial and the community level, right? And we talk about what firearm safety is and how each of those three components or th those three groups of people are responsible for firearm safety, number one. Number two, another thing um, that the Black Bottom Gun Club is, is completing right now, we are completing our youth firearm uh, education and safety initiative that not only takes, the, takes children through a three-phased approach, 
where we teach them not only about firearm safety, but we talk about conflict resolution, as Mr. McMurray said. We talk about uh, um, conflict mitigation and conflict avoidance. We talk about some of the indicators of trauma as well and how to spot those things so that you, so that these children and young adults are emotionally equipped and emotionally intelligent to know when to back off so that things don't get too crazy. Um, but in addition to that, one of the things that we're working on, um, I'll just say it right now, we're working on a scholarship program as well um, because we believe that fundamentally, a lot of these problems can be dealt with or addressed through education. And so one of the things that we believe is, is that if, if you teach people the right things or if you allow them the opportunity to learn the right things or pre present those things before them, they'll take them up. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, that are out there, at least you know, from the perspective of the Black Bottom Gun Club and that we're going to uh, expand some of our community partnerships that we currently have to get those things done. All right, we're gonna to go to the next question. But before we do that, we're gonna give you an opportunity, uh, NPO Robinson to kind of wrap up this uh, segment of uh, Q&A um, before we go to the next question. All right, so one, one thing I, I wanted to add, um, before I joined the police department, I was in the military, I served in the army. Then I've been on the police department for over 25 years. And one thing we do is train and train and train and train and train. And train. Training, 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 and some more training. Just like in any sport or whatever it is you do, if you're playing basketball, football, you go to practice, you practice and you practice. You know your sport, you know your craft. And so if you're going to be a responsible firearm owner, that's part of it. And I think right now with the minimum qualifications uh, to get your CPO, we have people out there that aren't trained up enough to be as responsible as they could be. And so... You know, if, if I were to advocate for, for anything, it would be for more training for those responsible uh, gun owners, because we have too many people out there that got guns that only use them when they're going through the training. And now they're carrying a gun, they three, four, five years in, and they've never used that gun, never practiced with that gun again. And so just adding training to, to that is part of being responsible, I believe. Very important, very important. Uh, Yelena, who, who's our next uh, question from? Okay, our next question is from Tommy. Tommy, thank you for joining us. Um, you have a question for the panel? Good evening, Councilman Tate and guests of the panel. Um, is the panel familiar with the theory of restorative justice? If not, it's a system of criminal justice which focuses on the rehabilitation of offenders through reconciliation with victims in the community at large. Do you feel this could be beneficial, particularly to Detroit, which is um, primarily a black and brown community? Any, anyone can answer. Yes, this is Commander Hope. And we, you, I am trained in restorative justice and practices. Um, we use this uh, in our youth programs. Uh, so it's very, very effective. And yes, it, for public, for anything, it is very effective. So what, what about, again, and, and, and this kind of walks us in the realm where we were talking with uh, Dr. Carr about, you know, having a restorative justice process for parents of those children who have been uh, accidentally uh, uh, killed by another child who has a parent as well. You got two parents that weren't involved in the actual shooting, but one is certainly liable because they left that firearm accessible to a child. Uh, any thoughts on uh, the city of Detroit entering or just in general government period, focusing on programming that uh, would allow for restorative justice for not just the children, but also the parents who are in that particular situation? I can answer that. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I would like to say to that um, is the fact that I wanted the parent, the, my my ex and the boy's mother to pay the price too because uh, one of them was an adult that was in the house when a horrible incident tragedy happened for me. Um, but they did not look at none of the adults. The boy supposed to have taken the stolen the gun from his grandmother's house. Grandmother did not get no charges in anything. So my thing is, 
if we was to make an adult, you know, accountable for their acts, then that would give them something to think about when they bring a gun into their homes. You know, I was listening to also, if I can make another quick statement too, um, the officer speaking in one um, regarding the, the guns in the locks. Um, everyone, you know, and everybody in the world is not going to have guns. We could petition for people not to have guns, not to sell guns, but guns is out here and people are going to have guns. Um, and I understand that, you know, I got friends who are officers and whatnot also, but uh, when we speak in reference to the gun locks, I think that um, my slogan to that is, uh, we need to get it to their neighborhoods. Not everybody is going to the police precincts in their neighborhood and picking up gun locks. To me, it's the bad people who have guns that's killing. It's not the good people who have guns that's killing. It's the bad people. The good people are the ones who's getting the education. Uh, the bad people don't have the money to get the education. It's the good people who are going to take classes, going to learn lessons, going to buy the locks to protect their families. The bad people with these guns, they're not doing that. And we need to get it, you know, I, I know, I know before this pandemic came out, a lot of churches was having like stop the gun violence and different programs within their church and their community. So, you know, right now it is a slowdown and we do need to try to think of ways, even if, you know, like one time they were dropping like little stuff at people's doors, if, you know, put it to them because I don't think a lot of people in their inner city is actually going to go to their local precinct and get guns. At least some of the ones that I do know of, they're not, you know. I've been in areas off Puritan and I can see some of them, they're not gonna go in there. And I, I, you know, I will be terrified sometimes when I'm in certain areas because you gotta watch what you say, watch how you walk, how you look because their reaction can be fatal towards you because they might be armed and they're not thinking about getting a lot. But from what I've heard from the officers and those who have these gun shooting community um, um, organization, that's real good because that is educating, but I would like Pookie and Ray Ray to be educated too, for they won't hurt, harm innocent people. Oh, Ms. Davis, that was so compelling. And I'm gonna tell you something, that's always been my dilemma since 2002. How do I get different economics, different education level, criminals, people who got, you know, you got kids in the, in the house with people that's drug dealers or hustlers or stick up men and they got guns. And how do you get them to lock their guns up so the little babies don't get the gun? That is the million dollar question. And so what some of my solutions have been is, who do they admire? They admire rappers. They admire street people, you know? So if you could get, if, when the police arrest some of them gang members, some of them street people, if you made them do a public service announcement and say, hey, even though we know the gats are illegal, you should lock them on this rack. You should put this cable lock to them. You should put them in a safe because you don't want the youngins, you don't want the young babies to die because you were irresponsible, because you was a street person, because you was uneducated. See, the hardest thing to do with this thing is we in America. And America say, everybody got the right to bear arms. And I mean, people hold on to that and die with it. You know, you, like Charlton Hesse say, you can't drag my gun out my dead hand. And ever since he said that, you know, everybody feel that they got the right to bear arms, but we got to push responsible firearm ownership because them same people, if they made the penalties bigger for when that little boy on LaSalle found that gun commander, you know, that, that 18 month old, that was the story, shot the five year old, okay? That's what I heard on the news. I don't know the backstory if y'all investigating and that's really how it went down. But the bottom line is, is that somebody need to pay for that irresponsibility. Just like Miss Davis said, somebody has to pay when you bring your child over to a house that he played at five times before and it was no problem. But this time, you know, Ray Ray, Raymond, John, I'm not trying to stereotype, left that gun on the table and the baby found it and shot the guest at the house. 
Now somebody got to pay in the justice system. Mm -hmm. They got to get, now you got a funeral, you got jail time, you got court, you got family resentments. You got all these things jumping off when all you needed to do was be responsible with that firearm from jump. So one, one thing I, I definitely want to make sure that we, we touch on is the fact that you know, we've talked about, you know, young people, we need to make sure we get the message to young people. There's a lot of older folk who find themselves in the same situation doing stupid, stupid, bad, horrible, horrific things on a regular basis. All you got to do is just read the news again, watch the news, you see it. And we also, when we talk about how do we spread the word, we got people in our own family that we can spread the word to. Amen. The guns that are out there don't necessarily say, hey, I'm a gun. I need somebody to secure me. You just telling your cousin, your sister, your brother, whoever, hey, do you have a firearm? Just ask them the question. Do you, are, do you have it secure? That goes a long way. This is, again, about educating as many people as we can. And if you're only relying on government to do it or the folks who are on the panel to do it, we're going to fail. We're going to mm -hmm. fail tremendously. We're going to continue to fail. Excuse me. We're going to continue to fail. So every one of us has a responsibility to spread this message. And it doesn't have to be on a billboard. It can be the, to the person sitting next to you, the person who you uh, care and regard, have high regard for. But it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we pass this message on, especially to those who are closest to us, because they're typically the ones who are going to listen to us mostly. Uh, NPO Robinson. All right. Um, I, I also want to add to as far as open carry, because we've seen a lot of people, as, as you mentioned, buying guns. Um, right now in Wayne County, we know, and, and probably across the state, um, getting your CPL is taking a lot longer than what it normally would take because it's such an influx. And so we have several people going out, call themselves doing an open carry and thinking that they're legal. And we're getting a lot of people as a commander to um, test to a lot of young people getting locked up for CCW because they're carrying that gun and they're not necessarily knowing what the rules or what the laws are regarding open carry. And so um, I, I would uh, just hope that everybody would do, do some research and figure out what they should and can be doing so that they won't you know, mess themselves up. A personal note, my son was one of those persons because he didn't want to wait. And so college kid, did everything right. His whole family, police officers, bought him a gun and he's standing on his mom's yard carrying it and then go to the store and forget he got it on him. And there you go. And, and so, I mean, it could pretty much happen to anybody. I mean, he, he's uh, 26, but I mean, just unfortunately, uh, our, our people, we, we just got to make sure we do as best we can and take that time and learn. And that's so true. The National Shooting Sports Foundation has a legislative arm that works very hard with the NRA to try to relax these gun laws. So open carry, you know, like, like uh, the brother said earlier, every state has different laws. There are states that you can buy a gun at 16. I know Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, so there's different laws for different states. And then you have to reconcile that with the open carry, the CPL and so forth. But that's one of the things we try to do at our prevention and education. We always have Detroit police or Wayne County Sheriff there to give the citizens instruction on what the current updates are so that they don't get caught. Even myself, I'm a CPL holder, but again, if I'm if I if I have my firearm on me and I don't have my car, isn't it true that you can take my gun because I don't have my CPL? Is That's that correct, right. Commander Day Dan? She said, she said yes. Before we, I want to make sure that I'm respectful of everyone's time. We're getting close to the end of the forum. We're going to have, we definitely have another question. But before we ask that question, and that question is actually coming to you, Dr. Carr, so be prepared. Uh, before we go to the question for Dr. Carr, we want to uh, get with uh, Mr. King and MPO Hill before we uh, get to Dr. Carr's question. Uh, Brother King. Sure. So uh, I have a comment and then I have a question um, relative to open carry and people open carrying and subsequently getting CCW charges. Here's a problem that we have. Um, it actually is just Wayne County that is having an issue with concealed pistol license processing. Uh, at the beginning of this, I'm sorry, beginning last year, sometimes concealed pistol license appointments, not the actual delivery of the car to your home address, 
but the actual process of getting an appointment to turn in the application was up to, in some cases, a year out. At the beginning of January, it was one year out to get the appointment to turn in the concealed pistol license application. Then it was another 45 days from there. At this point, the Wayne County clerk has completely stopped accepting appointments for concealed pistol licenses. So that in and of itself is a problem. And that's only happening in Wayne County. Other counties that are neighboring us, you're out roughly about uh, two weeks to maybe a month at, at, at worst. But in Wayne County, they've actually stopped taking applications. So you have a lot of people who have taken a concealed pistol license class and the students that I've taught, I go over heavily what open carry is and what open carry isn't. For those that don't know, open carry means that the firearm has to be completely visible at all times, no matter what. So if you're wearing a heavy coat, you need to have some type of drop leg holster or something to where that firearm is visible on the outside of the coat. You cannot have your firearm covered by your coat. You cannot transport your firearm in your vehicle unless it's in federal transport modes, which means it is in a case uh, designed for firearms in the rearmost portion of your trunk and unloaded, right? So that's what it means to be able to open carry legally. You, if it's other than that, then it's going to be a problem. You will catch that CCW charge. But I will submit that um, those CCW charges in the face of the fact that what's happening at the county level, I know this isn't really uh, uh, the purpose of this conversation, but I think it's something to be said that people are getting these CCW charges, but they can't get their concealed pistol licenses in a legal way when they're attempting to do so and they're trying to do so and through no fault of their own, they can't. That's my soapbox comment on that. Sorry about that. But my next question, though, for NPO Robinson is how, uh, roughly how many people are you seeing, if you can share that data, who are getting CCW charges from 2020 and through 2021 right now? Well, I don't have the numbers uh, right now, but I'm sure we could we could come up with them. But um, when, when my son, my son, he actually had that same ordeal, just like what you mentioned, went through the class and everything. And this was like, uh, like, uh, about last summer, uh, the end of the summer, September-ish. And I think that same week that he was arrested, there was over 20 plus uh, young men, same situation uh, with him that um, was waiting on a CPS class. So that's that's a lot. And so I'm sure it's been plenty uh, more. So uh, that's something um, we, could, we could come up with that number and uh, we could get back though. Uh, Can I just- NPO Hill? Yeah, I know Commander wants to say something. I just want to say two things. Uh, with open carry, we've had some cases where individuals have had walked around in the street and got robbed. So now we got two illegal guns out on the street, and thank God the person didn't get injured, hurt, or killed. So you got to be wise about what you're doing out there. Uh, secondly, if you do have a CPL license and you don't have it on your person, that's going to go to the gun board. And you're going to get a ticket for that. So, we, yeah, yeah, we can pull you. And this, it comes to the behavior, too. If I'm doing a traffic stop, as Mr. King, you know, you need to comply with the law. So it's that behavior. We talk to you, talk to you. Hey, I don't have it on me. I have my fire and whatever. We're going to do it in a respectful manner, or retrieve, get back. Once I run your name and everything, we're going to know if you got it or not. So then that's not going to go through the facts. So, Mr. McMurray, on that note, you know, we'll do our investigation and we'll take it from there on that level. You're not going to be arrested if you're a legal CPL holder, but you will get a citation. Then it's up to the board to decide if they're going to, you know, take that or not. But the thing is this, it's behavior and responsibility. That is what we're dealing with. The same as you have responsibility to drive a motor vehicle. A motor vehicle, if you're drinking and driving, can cause harm and death. Same with a firearm. I think if we put a PSA out there in our community, a PSA, like this forum is going on, it needs to be expressed to everybody. And I think it'd be a pretty good way of getting it out there uh, about the responsibilities of your Second Amendment constitutional right to have your firearm. But also, you got to be safe. You got a constitutional right to uh, go to church. Do you have a constitutional right to have your firearm in a church? Michigan law says it's up to the pastor or the mosque or whatever. So we need to know the law. We need to know law. We need to understand behavior, law, in our household, in ourselves. <laughs> if you if if you're not if you're afraid of a firearm, don't go out there and try to purchase one. Because it's not for you. 
Commander Hope, I want to give you the last word. I know you, you, you raised your hand. And then again, we're going to go to Dr. Carr. And I believe that's our last question for this evening. And then we'll give everyone an opportunity to provide any final statements. Uh, Commander Hope. Yes, thank you so much, Councilman Tay. Um, actually, MPO Hill, he kind of summarized what I wanted to say. But in addition to that, um, it, there is discretion that we have. But the key, I think, for a lot of things is the educational part with our discretion. And we saw that a lot during the protests where people wanted to open carry and they really didn't have any clue about what they were doing other than what other people were doing. And the thing is, is about walking up, you know, asking about the CPL, asking about, you know, what do you have? What are you trying to do here? And to make sure that they're within the guidelines, you know, of, of having and, and, and possessing that weapon in the right fashion, either you CPL and it's concealed or either you open carry, meaning you can't get in the car and drive off with that weapon open. So it's, it's really an educational thing as well. And so when we have our young officers, we really, really are pressing down, just advise, let's advise, discussion, find out what, what it is that their intent is. Are they operating in a legal fashion? And if not, what are they trying to do? And, and I think that goes a long way because we're not trying to ruin lives and, and getting chumped up arrests and, and felony convictions off of people that are trying to do the right thing, but they don't have the right information to do it. Uh, Yelena, uh, what, who, what's our question to Dr. Carr? This will be our last uh, question for the evening, it appears. Yes, Councilman. This is from Tiana. She asked, um, in what capacity do you, Dr. Carr, work with victims of gun violence? So currently right now, I work with a program called DLive, and we work with members that come through the hospital, primarily Sinai Grace or Receiving. And when they come through um, for an act of violence, such as gunshots or stabbing or even domestic violence, once they are um, okay, we could then work with them and be part of our program. So as part of our program, they would see me, Dr. Carr and Dr. Houston for therapeutic services, but we also provide them services such as food, um, education, if they need to get back into school, if they need employment, we also work with them as housing as well. So a lot of case management services there too. So we find that a lot of our members that participate in the program have a lot of trauma that they have dealt with in their life as a child through an adult to where they're in the situation where they're now injured by those means. And so we really try to sit and work with them and help them change their mindset, change their environment, and really be able to give them the tools that they need to be able to succeed. So a lot of them have PTSD, we, we battle that. They deal with anger, anxiety, depression. And if you don't know how to handle those things, they can just erupt and come out in any way. And so we give them the tools that they need to understand their emotions and to be able to utilize different practices to be able to be a benefit in their society and in their environment. Amen. All right. Well, again, I want to thank the panel for uh, being here this evening. Thank everyone for watching as well. Does anyone from the panel want to provide any last statements, final statements before we wrap up? Uh, the floor will be yours. Well, I'd just like to say I'm honored to be here and I would like to work with anybody who would like to keep this dialogue going and to get this out viral. I think some of the good ideas we came up with were to definitely reach our audience and try to educate them on a common sense and practical responsible firearm ownership program, a new system of doing things other than what they've been doing because we know what we've been doing doesn't work. So I'm definitely available at www.theamericanrack.com and, and, and Councilman Tate, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm so proud of all our colleagues as everybody's trying to reach each other in their own way. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ms. Davis, I saw you wanted to say a few words. Yes, I also like to just thank you um, and your um, organization, your group, um, Ms. Yalanta for contacting me. Um, sometimes for any, um, what you would call, I don't really like to I would say a victim, but some organization call myself a survivor of gun violence, but I still say I'm a victim. Um, 
just to give an opportunity just to speak about my son, speak about, you know, um, how I feel about guns and whatnot. Um, from what I heard, I wish that it was out, you know, even long years ago. Um, it really begins in the home. I scared my son straight, you know, and my, my cousins and whatnot, nephew, about guns. If you scare them straight, they won't touch it in a household. Um, but those who, like I said earlier, I guess that was my closing part too, was the fact that um, educate, you know, within the churches and the schools. I would love to go into the school as a victim of a, uh, a one who lost someone so dear um, and, and talk to kids um, about gun violence and what it can do, how it can distract a family. Because once you shoot, that's it. You, you can't redo it. And it affects so many lives. Um, my child life affected, of course, mine as mom, but so many others. And so I just think that education is good for the young people to know and that the parents and grandparents and uncle want to realize that they, it's a price that they need to have to pay. And I think if once we educate and let the parents and grandparents know, uh, maybe people will be a little bit more wiser with guns because yes, people are going to have guns, but we need to educate them more for it won't be more tragedies coming in the forthcoming months, you know, if we can educate more. Thank you. Well, Ms. Davis, we want to again thank you for being here and just your presence alone and you sharing your story has helped educate a number of individuals and we're going to keep continue to run this video so people can feel and understand the pain that a parent goes through and maybe hopefully prayerfully that will change some individuals um, operating um, the way they operate with their firearms. Yeah, because eight years ago I wouldn't been able to speak. I, I was a basket case so God has given me the strength to be able to talk now because eight minutes, eight years ago if you say my son's name, I was boohooing. Um, so I just thank God for the strength that he, he has given me to, to make it this far, even to say I'm still here on earth and still standing because uh, not to be spiritual, you know, throw that in, but, you know, without, you know, him above, I would not be able to be in front of you right now or even speak because uh, that could have taken me out because like I said, that was my one and only. And, you know, I just thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, MPO Robinson. And then we're going to go to uh, Mr. King. So uh, thank you for uh, having us on. And I'd like to say to responsible firearm owners or all firearm owners, I should say um, safety, education, and training and training again make sure train 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 educate yourself and also for anybody with a program or um, that has concerns about actually having access to any locks or anything like that feel free to reach out to chief's neighborhood liaison's office or your mpos at your local precinct and you know if, if you have concerns about making it to the precinct or whatever to get your lock i mean we'll work with you in any way just to make sure we do whatever we have to do to get that gun lock on that gun Awesome. And we're going to make sure we have a, a contact sheet that's coming up after we wrap up so that the folks who are looking to uh, engage with all of you who are here today will have an opportunity to do that. Uh, Brother King. Sure. Um, again, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, again, Ms. Davis, I, I am thankful that you were able to share your story. Um, it's not the story that we want to hear, but it's absolutely a story that we need to hear so that it's real and tangible for everyone so that we can do something about the problem of violence, especially the violence that takes away our, our, um, our future, our children. Um, I, I like to say that, as I said at the very beginning, um, firearm safety and firearm education and not, is not just the responsibility of the individual gun owner. It's the responsibility of the entire community. It's the responsibility of the entire family. And once we get to the point where we are more cognizant of that fact, where we're cognizant of and aware of the legalities of firearms ownership and the standards of safety that we must adhere to, again, not just as gun owners, but those who don't have guns because your children or your relative may interface with someone who does have a firearm. That's why it's everyone's responsibility to be safe with a firearm or safe around firearms. 
Um, uh, to that end, I would just say that if you're interested in joining the Black Bottom Gun Club or the National African American Gun Association, you can go to NAAGA.co and you can email us at blackbottomgc at gmail.com. We'd love to have you. We'd love to work with you and get some things done. Uh, to that point of uh, NPO Robinson's uh, perspective, training and education is absolutely integral and necessary uh, when you're going to have a firearm. It's a requirement. Thank you. Any other final words? All right. Uh, off uh, MPO Hill. Uh, yes. I want to say on behalf of the whole uh, panel, I thank you all and thank you, Councilman, for allowing me to be on here. Uh, Ms. Davis, hey, whatever you need, the department is here from, for you. I know Commander can vouch for that. Uh, but I, Again, safety, safety, safety. And the way that the pandemic is going, behavior is out there, uh, we have to be responsible. If, if you're not comfortable with a firearm, again, stop, don't touch, lead the area, tell an adult. For an adult, stop, don't touch. Uh, you know, just, just let it be where it's at. Uh, we have to think about ourselves and our community and our environment. So again, uh, thanks for allowing me to be on this panel. Uh, everybody be safe. And again, let's let's lock up and put away for those who are in our homes when it comes to that time to have company from, from the children to strangers. Uh, just be safe out there and lock it up. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final words? Uh, Dr. Carr? Yes, I just want to say thank you so much again, Councilman Tate, for inviting me. I thank you so much, Ms. Davis, for sharing your story. I totally agree with you 100% that we do need to bring some of this education into the school so that children will know um, what it looks like, how they what they should be doing, and they can be the ones to take it back home and tell their parents as well. I'm also a big, big supporter of family uh, programs and interventions in the schools as well. And this could definitely be a great topic um, that is needed in every community. So um, I'm here to help in any way. If anybody ever needs any help or assistance, I am here. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much again. Thank you again for being here. Commander, you have the last word. Uh, for those folks who are looking to participate in the program, getting the, the, getting the trigger locks uh, from the city of Detroit, uh, what do you want to tell those who are watching and, and can spread that information? So please, please be very careful and very cautious. You all, we cannot bring a life back. We need to pay attention. We know that all of these things bring up a lot of emotion within us. And because of that reason alone should give us that, that one cue to say, you know what, let me double check and check. And we should always try to spread the word uh, to other people, you know, to be safe in their homes. Councilman, I'd like to say thank you so much um, for giving us this opportunity. And I know it's the end of the day, but I just wanna invite if anyone would like any training or anything from our unit, from the Chief's Neighborhood Liaison for our youth, um, please let me know and we can set something up um, because it's not gonna stop here. It is a message and let this be the piece PSA for it. So thank you so much. Thank you. And again, I just can't thank you all enough. This is a very important conversation, very important in this moment in time in Detroit's history, uh, important for our people. And uh, getting the message out is critically key. And it's a little bit more challenging now doing so. But we're going to make sure we do that and continue these conversations. This is just one of the many conversations that we're going to have um, regarding gun violence and gun safety, but it's gonna be going beyond just, as we see here, well beyond just discussions. It's about the actions. And so I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation and the, the work with everybody on this particular panel. Uh, I have nothing else to add because you guys have been so great. Again, thank you so much. Um, we wanna make sure we have the uh, contact card that is up. Reggie, can you bring that up right now? Make sure that we, before we wrap up, all right. On behalf of District 1, Discover D1, D1 CAN, all of our D1 programs, we want to thank you and the residents of the city of Detroit and District 1. Thank you for taking part in tonight's forum. Here's the information, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>